But how, what a blessing. Thank you so much for sharing that. I know what I'm going to be singing in my showers. Um, go ye there. Boy, that's going to be good, guys. Let's do it. Let's sing. I know you guys are going to sing too. Amen? Uh, yeah, you don't sound too enthused about that. Okay. Well, I want to make a quick announcement before I preach this morning. Um, I had forgot to mention this, but we actually have a special revival weekend taking place this coming weekend. Uh, actually, it's starting on Thursday night, and uh, we have a guest speaker. He's a really good friend of mine. His name is Michael Tuzon, and uh, he's a director of Souls West, and he's coming out here to speak, I believe, four messages and a Q&A session. So I want to invite all of you. You're all welcome to come. Uh, the first two meetings will be held in Thatcher Chapel, so it's on, on, in campus, in the girls' dormitory. It's the second floor. Uh, so you want to come out for that. So Thursday night, Friday night at Thatcher Chapel, and then Saturday morning, it's, all the meetings are going to be held here. And then after potluck, we're going to be having a Q&A session where you can a ask him any questions related to the topic, as well as any questions that you may have on your heart. So uh, what is the first day that we're going to have the revival weekend? Thursday. Thursday. So you want to come out, and the meetings start at 7.30 p.m. 7.30 p.m., and then here at the church, we'll, be, uh, we'll start at 10. All right. Uh, well, with that said, uh, the message this morning is entitled... The story of the sanctuary. The story of the sanctuary. How many of you guys get excited when you hear about the sanctuary? Yeah? I see a few of you kind of hesitant, like, yeah, should I raise my hand? I don't know about you, but I remember when I was um, a young Christian studying the Word of God. I remember, uh, I remember when I would hear about the sanctuary, or someone would introduce the topic of the sanctuary for a Bible study, or someone at the pulpit would say, hey, I'm going to be talking about the sanctuary. I remember when I would hear the word sanctuary, I'd always, almost like just turn off my mind, right? Because when I was growing up in the church, when I would hear about the sanctuary, it kind of seemed a little boring to me. Um, oftentimes, you know, when the sanctuary would be taught, it would be uh, you know, we would talk about, like, the specifications of the sanctuary, right? You would talk about the veil, you would talk about... Um, the horns on the altar. Uh, you would talk about all of these details of the, the, of the furniture within the sanctuary. And I remember I would just like, when I would listen to that, you know, not being converted and, and listening to that, I, I remember it just, it would be so boring to me. It would be so boring to me. And I remember when I was converted, back when I was 19, and I went through a series of Bible studies again. I remember we got to the study of the sanctuary. And I remember the, the, the person who gave the Bible study, I remember he introduced, we're going to be talking about the sanctuary this evening. And I remember when I heard that word again, I was like, oh man, this is going to be boring. <laughs> but then he started to show me that when you look at the sanctuary, that there's actually a story in the sanctuary. Do you guys, do you guys know that? That there is a story that is being told in the sanctuary. And so when he introduced it that way and he started to go through the story of the sanctuary, then the sanctuary became relevant to me. And when I would study the sanctuary in my personal devotions, or when I would be taking notes, listening to messages on the sanctuary, I would be so excited because I understand the story of the sanctuary. And all the details as we would, as you know, speakers or, or, or Bible study teachers would go through the details with me, those were starting to become more powerful as I understood the story of the sanctuary. So this morning, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at the story that the sanctuary tells. And um, I'm, hopefully, I'm hoping that after you hear about the story, that you'll be more encouraged to study the sanctuary. And by the way, what makes Adventists unique from other Christian denominations? It has to do with the sanctuary. And if you can understand the sanctuary, the earthly sanctuary, you'll be able to understand what Christ had done here on this earth, but also what Christ is doing for us today in the heavenly sanctuary. And so I really want to encourage you guys to study the sanctuary out, but I'm hoping to inspire you to study it this morning. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer, and we'll get right into the story. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship. Take joy, my King, in what you 
hear. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Father in heaven, um, it is my prayer that the words that are presented here this morning may be a sweet sound to your ears. And I pray that it would be a sweet sound to those that are listening as well. Father, I pray for the blessing of your Holy Spirit to abide in my heart this morning. For Lord, uh, as I had mentioned this morning, no one has come here to hear the words of a preacher. They have come here to hear the words, your words. And I want to ask, Father, that that would be the reality here this morning. Father, I want to ask that you please um, inspire us to really study out the sanctuary message. Because, Father, it's such a beautiful message. And if we can only understand the story of the sanctuary, Father, I, I believe that, that all the details of the sanctuary would become beautiful to us. And so it is my prayer, Father, that as I share the story that is found in the sanctuary, I ask that you please help this story to be told with power. And I pray, Lord, that uh, the message of the story um, would resonate with our hearts and our minds. And whatever lessons we can pull from this story today, Father, I pray that we would be able to apply it to our lives. Father, we love you so much, and I just pray that it would hide behind the cross of Calvary, that Jesus would be lifted up, and that all would be blessed. For I ask these things in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, if you can turn your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 25. Exodus chapter 25, and we're going to be looking at verse 8. Exodus chapter 25, looking at verse 8. And as you are tell, uh, turning there, I'm going to go ahead and share with you a story that I heard about. And it's a story about a, a boy named Sharuk. What's his name? Sorry, it's not Sharuk. It's Sharu. <laughs> it's Sharu. Uh, Sharu was, um, he was uh, born in India. And um, he had sort of a tough upbringing. Uh, you see, before the age of five years old, his father had passed away. Um, actually, I'm mi mixing up stories. When, before he was five years old, his father did not pass away. I think his father left. His father left the family. And so the father left the family, and, and, and the mother was left to tend to three children. How many children? Three, three children. Um, uh, the names of the children were Sheru, Gadu, and I cannot remember the, the, the little girl's name, but there was three of them. And uh, this, this sing, single mother basically did not have a lot of money. She was poor. And so she would work all the time. And she was a hard worker. And um, she also needed more money, so she actually sent out her children to do work for her as well. And so all three of them would be busy doing something for their mother. Now, uh, Gadu was the eldest of the three. And Gadu was, um, he did a lot of things for the family. And in fact, he, he functioned as the, uh, the adult male, if you will, for the family. And so he would always take on these jobs. And there was this one particular job that would cause him to have to go to these, uh, uh, these train stations, and he would sweep the train stations. And this would be like an overnight type of job. And so Gadu, he received a call to, to do that. And so he was just about to leave in the middle of the night when Sheru saw him get up. Now, Sheru always loved to be around his brother Gadu. And so Sheru saw him leaving, and he's like, He's like, uh, Gadu, Gadu, where are you going? Where are you going? And Gadu told him, I have to go to work. I have to go to work. I will be back. But Shiru was like, I want to go with you. I want to go with you. Now, Shiru was about, I think he was like five years old at this time. And so here's little Shiru. You know, he's, he's like kind of like trying to t uh, trail his brother. And, and, and Gadu was like, no, go back home. Go back home. You know, he's kind of annoyed. But Shiru kept following him. And so Gadu decided, okay, I'm going to go and take my little brother. So he picks him up. And he starts walking over to the, the train station. They get to the train station, and they move to another station, and they get to the destination that they need to be at. But what ended up happening as they were on the way to the other train station, Sheru fell asleep, right? He's five years old. It was late, so he fell asleep on his brother. And then when they got to the destination, Gadu tried to wake him up. He's like, Sheru, Sheru, we're here. We're ready. We, we need to work. We need to work. But Sheru would not wake up. Right? He would open up his eyes, look at his brother, and just shut his eyes again. Right? He's just super tired. And so Gadu is just sort of in a predicament here. He's like, I need to work, but I have my little brother. What am, what am I going to do? So Gadu 
tells Sheru, he whispers to him, she says, Sheru, I'm going to leave you here on this bench, but I will come back for you. So stay here. Sleep all night. Stay here. I will be back after I'm done with work. So Sheru just kind of hears it, and then he falls asleep again. And then Sheru wakes up a few, few hours later in the middle of the night, and he notices his brother's not there. So he waits a little bit. His brother doesn't show up. And he's like, you know what? Maybe my brother is in the train. There was a train that stopped in the station. And so he, he climbs, himself, climbs into, this, uh, this, uh, into one of the cars, the cars of the train. He goes inside, and he's looking for his brother. He's calling out his name, but, but Gadu uh, never says anything. Or Gadu, he doesn't hear his brother's voice. And so what ends up happening is he actually falls asleep inside the car of the train. Oh, you guys know where this is going on. So he falls asleep in this train, and the next morning, the train leaves. The train leaves. Now, mind you, Sheru doesn't really know how to say his hometown. He can, I, I, think he's, I can forget what his hometown was, uh, what the name of it was, but he could barely pronounce it. And so here's this five-year-old boy in this train, and it's, it's moving one direction away from his hometown, and it, it travels about 1,000 miles, about 1,000 miles. And so here's Sheru, five years old, gets out of, the pl- uh, out of the train, and he's panicking, screaming for God. He's like, Gadu, Gadu, where are you? Just, just so scared, doesn't know what he's going to do. He's asking people, you know, with what limited language he has, can you help me find home? Can you help me find home? And he's just lost. Now, I don't want to go into uh, the details of the story because we don't have time. But anyway, what ends up happening is he gets, uh, he's, in the streets by himself, and he, tra- he learns how to survive by himself. So he learns how to feed himself. And there are times where people tried to kidnap him, because back in those days, if, if kids were in the streets, roaming in the streets, there would be adults who would kidnap them and, and use them for, for slavery, right, for sex trafficking. And there were times where he would share that, that that would happen. He would be sleeping, and there would be adults coming, screaming, trying to chase the kids, and he would have to run away. So here's this young boy, and Uh, Eventually, he gets into this orphanage or whatnot, and what ends up happening is this Australian couple adopts him, adopts him, takes him to Australia. And so for the next 20 20 or so years, he's in Australia, but in the back of his head, he's thinking, I want to go home. I want to see my mom again. Not that the Australian family wasn't good, but he just missed home a lot. And so the thing is, obviously, Sheru didn't know the place where he was born. I mean, he, he knew, he kind of had a, a, he understood, like, he didn't know how to say it, and so no one knew what he was talking about. And so 25 years later, basically, um, someone suggested, hey, why don't you try to look for your home using Google Maps? <laughs> now, fortunately, Google Maps, ma- Maps existed at that, uh, you know, when, when he was, uh, you know, trying to find home. And so he, he went online, and he would spend countless hours, countless days, just looking through Google Maps, looking through India, right? Trying to see if he can just, just somehow find home. And so he would look at all these train stations, and there are tons of train stations in India. He's just looking at each of these train stations because he remembers certain things about the train station that he was at, you know, before he, he got lost. And so sure enough, what ends up happening is he finds this train station that looked very familiar, right? He saw this, like, water tower that was by the train station. That's what he remembered when he, before he got lost. And so he saw that, and he started to kind of, like, just trace his way back, trying to figure out. And as he started to do that, I mean, this took countless hours and, and, and days, but as he continued to do that, he eventually found his house. So he flies over to India, and he goes over to that village and finds his mom finds his mom. And his mom stayed there the entire time. She could have moved, right? Several years, but she stayed there because she had this feeling that someday his, her son was going to come back. How powerful. Um, the reason why I share that story is because it's, it's very similar to, uh, to the story of the Bible in that we are lost. Isn't that true? <laughs> the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have lost our way, if you will. And just like Sheru, in order for us to find our way back, there is a map. There is a way that we can find our way back home. And that map, I would suggest to you, is the sanctuary. 
If you study out the sanctuary, you will be able to find your way back to where God intended you to be. Amen? And so we're going to be studying out this morning. Let's look at Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8. And if the church is there, if you can let me know by saying amen. 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 The Bible says in Exodus chapter 25, verse 8, it says, And let them make me a what? A sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So it was God's command to Moses that Moses would build a sanctuary for the children of Israel that he would be able to dwell with them. Now, there are three things that this verse tells us or implies. The first thing is that God delights to dwell with his people. Amen? God is eager. He, is, he, is, he, is so, he just wants to spend time with us. He wants to have interactions with us. In fact, if he can have his way right now, he would like to have a face-to-face interaction with you and I. God delights to dwell with his people. This verse also applies another thing. The fact that God desires to dwell with his be- people tells us that something is separating us from God. Isn't that true? Because he delights to dwell with us, it tells us that there's something in the way of a relationship with God. And the last thing is this, that the sanctuary gives God the ability to dwell with his people again. The sanctuary gives God the ability to dwell with his people again. Question, friends, what is the very thing that is separating us from God? Okay, we all say sin. Do you guys have a passage? Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2. Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2. What is that very thing that is separating us from God? And I think you all got it right. But let's look at verses 1 and 2. And when you get there, if you can let me know by saying amen. And if you're not there yet, if you can let me know by saying have mercy. All right, mercy is given. All right. The Bible says in verse 1, notice what it says. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your what? Your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. So what is the very thing that is separating us from God? It is our own iniquities. Because of our iniquities, God has no choice but to hide his face from us. And we're going to get into that a little bit more on a deeper level. But in order for us to understand the sanctuary, in order for us to understand the story of the sanctuary, we need to understand the context of which the story is being told. And in the book of Genesis chapter 3, if you can turn there real quick with me, Genesis chapter 3, we are going to see where how sin had entered into this world, right? Because in Genesis chapter 3, that chapter is entitled The Fall of Man. And so Genesis chapter 3, looking at verses 1 through 6, we find how sin started to enter into this earth, right? Because Satan, um, who disguised himself as a serpent, was on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the very tree that God said to Adam and Eve, this is the tree that you should not eat from, right? You can eat of any tree in the garden, the mango tree, the apple tree, any sorts of trees, the dur- I don't know, does dur- the durians grow on trees? Amen. <laughs> Someone says that durian is the forbidden fruit, right? Because it has spikes on it. I don't know. I actually like durian. Do you guys like durian? Anyway, so Adam and Eve, I digress. Adam and Eve, they could eat of any tree in the garden, but there was one tree that they could not eat of. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But Eve got a little curious for her own good, so she started walking away from her her, her husband, Adam, which actually she was instructed not to do that. She, She was instructed to stick with Adam. They were to stay close to each other. But Eve, she was walking around the midst, uh, through the, throughout the garden, and she saw the tree that God told her not to touch. And it's like, a, it's like a child, right? You say, don't do it, and they do it, right? So Eve, she goes into the tree, and she sees a serpent, and the serpent is talking to her, and the serpent deceives her. She eats the fruit, she takes the fruit, gives it to Adam, Adam eats the fruit, and now we have sin in the world, right? Now you guys know the story. Adam and Eve, though they were naked before, for some reason they found themselves more naked or something like that, right? So they, they ate this fruit, they looked down, they're like, man, we are naked, and so they were ashamed, and the, the Bible talks about how they started to hide behind trees. God walks in the midst of the garden saying, Adam, where are you? 
right? Now, did God need to ask that question? He did, right? He knew where he was, but the, the question was for, more for Adam to get to him to start to think. And so here, Adam and Eve, they're hiding behind the trees. Finally, God sees them, but God does not see them naked. He sees them clothed with something. What were they clothed with? Yeah, somehow they had enough time to, to sew themselves these fig leaves, right? Big enough to cover their bodies. So they had these fig leaves, that's, they were clothed in these fig leaves. But here's the question for you this morning. When God saw Adam and Eve, do you think in his mind he was thinking, man, those are some nice fig leaves? Was he impressed? Was he like, where did you get these? I want to get a, get a pair, you know, set for myself. Was, was God impressed about the fig leaves? No, he wasn't. And why do we say that? Because God replaced those clothes, didn't he? Did he not? What did he replace those clothes with? Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. Notice what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. It's the church there, amen? The Bible says, Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. The Bible does not say he went to the durian tree and picked up durian leaves to clothe them, right? The Bible says that he took tunics of skins. What were those, where were those skins from? It had to be from an animal, which tells us, friends, the Bible doesn't say it here, but it tells us that God had to kill something, right? Now, do you think that was, that was hard for God? Absolutely. God never, had to, God never intends to kill his creation. Never wants to. That's not in his will. But in this instance, he had to. And so he kills this animal as a sacrifice, and he clothes Adam and Eve with these animal skins. Now, I don't think you have to be in a, you know, you don't have to have a theology degree to, to answer this, but what does that sacrifice represent? Who? Jesus. Interesting. Turn your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. And when you get there, if I can uh, hear a happy and hearty amen. amen. All right, we'll work on that. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. Notice what the Bible says. Now, in light of what we just read or what we just talked about, look at verse 8. It says, All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of the life of life of the Lamb, slain from when? foundation of the world. What is the foundation of the world? When is it? It's back in Genesis, right? It's back in Genesis. It's, but it's very interesting here that the Bible says that there was a lamb, which is obviously who? Jesus Christ. The lamb, Jesus Christ, was slain at the foundation of the world. What does that mean? Was, was Jesus, did Jesus die back at the Garden of Eden? When did Jesus die, by the way? The first century, right? So, so how, can, how, how does this add up? Or It seems like this is kind of contradictory, right? But I want to let you know something here. And man, I don't have time. Oh. But I'm just going to say this. I'm just going to say this. That when Adam and Eve when they decided to partake of that fruit, when they transgressed God's will, you know what Jesus did? He immediately went to the Father and he said, I'm going to take their place. I'm going to take their place. No hesitation. And you know what's incredible? If you read early writings, if you read early writings, and that's why I'm saying I don't have enough time, I'd read you the passage. But Jesus, when he went to the Father, and the first time he told them, hey, I'm going to take their place, you know what the Father did? Let's think about this. Let's, 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 reason, let's reason out. Let, let's talk about this for a moment. You know why? Because the father really loved his son. And you know, the, the, the spirit of prophecy says that Jesus had to go back and forth to his father three times. Three times. And it was not until the third time that Jesus finally went out and, and shared with the heavenly angels that the father has accepted my decision to die for humanity. And my friends, the reason why the Bible says in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, that Jesus, the Lamb of God, was slain from the foundation of the world is because when Jesus says something, 
It's as though it already, it, it already happened. Does that make sense? When Jesus commits to something, that means that it's going to happen. The Father knew that the life of Jesus was going to be given for humanity. Wow. And my friends, this is the reason why, by the way, that the fig leaves weren't good enough. Because that animal that was sacrificed represented the sacrifice of Jesus. You see, there's nothing that we can do to inherit eternal life. There's nothing that we can do to save our own selves. Isn't that true? The only way to salvation is Jesus Christ. I know of no other name. Jesus alone is the only one that can save us. And he wanted to demonstrate that, that back in the Garden of Eden. And, and, and the, same was, the same is true throughout all of ages of, of time. You see, after the Garden of Eden, guess what? Those who wanted to follow the Lord, what were they required to do? They were required to bring a sacrifice for their sins. You guys remember the story of Cain and Abel? Abel brought his sacrifice. Cain brought his best fruits. Which sacrifice was accepted? Abel's sacrifice. Why? Because God needed an animal to be sacrificed because that represented Jesus being sacrificed. And so this makes sense as we get into the book of Exodus because in the book of Exodus, now we see that God commands Moses to erect a sanctuary, right? Right? And this sanctuary is not just like a church, right? He's not just wanting the sanctuary so you can have this big mega church where all the Israelites come and they just praise the Lord. No, he wants this sanctuary built because the sanctuary will teach the Israelites how to come back to God. And by the way, what did every sinner need to bring to the sanctuary? They had to bring a sacrifice. All right, I have a few slides here. It's kind of rare for me to use slides at church, but... For the purpose of illustration's sake, um, I have some pictures of the sanctuary. So are we uh, ready to go? So again, we're talking about the story of the sanctuary. Um, so this is sort of a, a bird's eye view of what the sanctuary would look like, right? You have all the Israelites outside of the sanctuary. And uh, there you would have the cloud by day, which represents whose presence? God's presence. And then you have the, the pillar of fire by night. Now, how incredible would that be if you were the Israelites at this time? It baffles my mind, by the way, that when we read through the story of the Israelites, they constantly complain and murmur and are like, doubtful. How can you be doubtful, right? When you have like cloud by day, fire by night, manna falling down from heaven. It is incredible. But by the, by the way, that teaches us something, that miracles aren't the, the, the ideal way of convincing someone to the truth. Keep that in mind. By the way, Satan is going to use miracles in the last days. The word of God is the only thing that can really convince you and settle you in the truth. But here we have the cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. Question. Where were the sinners? Ooh, hey, you can stay there. Where were the sinners? Outside of the sanctuary. Now, I want you to go back to Genesis chapter 3 real quick. All right, I see I have nine minutes. Um, can you guys sacrifice a little bit of potluck time? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Just a few more minutes, okay? Genesis chapter 3, and I want you to notice what it says in verse, um, verse 24, verse 23. Verse 23. All right, are you there? Amen. The Bible says, Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So let's go to verse 24. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. To guard the way to the tree of life. Okay. Whose presence did Adam and Eve have the privilege uh, to have? God's presence. Now, when you look at the sanctuary, right, you have that, out, you have that uh, courtyard, you have the holy place, and the most holy place. There's three segments of the sanctuary. Where is the presence of God in the sanctuary? It's in the where? In the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, right? That's where God's presence is. That's where the Shekinah glory is. So if, if, if we were just looking at the sanctuary, right, if we were to say 
Adam and Eve, before they sinned, where would they be in the sanctuary? What would you say? In the most holy place, because that's where God's presence is, right? But, but when, we, when we study the sanctuary, the earthly sanctuary, we, we just talked about this, but where are the sinners in the sanctuary? They're outside of the sanctuary. They're outside of the courtyard, right? You guys following me so far? And so in order for them, and it makes sense, actually, in Genesis chapter 3, because they were banished from the garden, from the very presence of God. So, so that's why it makes sense that they were outside of the sanctuary. Now, I talked about something very important. I had said that in order for a sinner, in order for a sinner to rec- be reconciled to God, to come back to the Lord, they must bring a sacrifice. And we know that the sacrifice represents... Jesus. So them bringing a lamb, them bringing a lamb for the sacrifice, they're basically showing to everyone and and, and they're proving to God that, hey, listen, I'm wanting to accept the sacrifice of Jesus on my behalf. Turn your Bibles with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And as you are turning there, uh, we find that that there is a, the first piece of the furniture in, in the sanctuary in the courtyard. And what is that first piece, or that first furniture? The altar of Burnt offering. And what is that, or burnt sacrifice? What is that altar or burnt sacrifice? Why is that there? What is that intended for? It's so that the sacrifice can be placed upon that altar and the, and, and the, and the lamb can be killed, right? Does that make sense? So that is the first piece of furniture. That's where, that is where the sinner would come and the priest would meet with him. And that's where the sacrifice would be made. And the reason why this sacrifice was important, because in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, the Bible tells us this. Oops, I'm not there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. Is everybody there? So I'm the laggard, huh? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, looking at verse 21, it says, For he made him who knew no sin. Who's that that did not know sin? Jesus, right? Who knew no sin to be sin? For us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. When Jesus said to the Father, I'm going to take man's place, he says, I'm going to be sin for them. I'm going to take their place. I'm going to take the curse. I will die their death that they deserve. That's what Jesus did for us. Isn't that beautiful? That is so beautiful. And so when, when the sinner brings a sacrifice to the altar, a, 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 a burnt sacrifice, that sinner is acknowledging that they want Jesus to take their place, as hard as that is, willing to take the sacrifice that Jesus is offering to me. So here's the thing that's beautiful. Oh, wow. Uh, let's, let's go back. So here's the thing that's beautiful. So if we were to say, where is Jesus in the sanctuary before he came to this earth? Where would you say he was at? Why do you say that? Because that's where God's presence is here. But here's the thing that's very interesting. Where did Jesus have to travel to meet the sinner? Technically speaking, it would be at at the gate. And there's reasons that I could say that. But actually, let's just for the sake of keeping things simple, Jesus had to go to the altar of burnt sacrifice, right? Offering. Why? Because he needed to meet the sinner where they were at, right? There's something beautiful here. And, you know, I talked about the story of Sheru, right? Sheru, he had to find his way back. And many of us, we have to find our way back. But there's something else that's beautiful about the gospel message, and that is that though we may want to seek after God, guess what? Jesus had already been seeking for you. Jesus is in hot pursuit for you. God is the one that immediately, guess what? When Adam and Eve committed sin, what what, what did God do? What did Jesus do? He walked through the midst of the garden. He was in pursuit. He wanted to help Adam and Eve. My friends, Jesus is chasing after us, amen? And so here we find that though the sinner had committed sin, was banished from his presence, we find the sinner has a way back. So they have to go to the altar of burnt sacrifice, which represents them accepting Jesus Christ by faith. And then, here's something else I want to note. After the altar of burnt sacrifice, what's the next furniture? What does the labor represent? What do you guys think that represents? Baptism. 
right? You have the priest, after they had uh, performed the sacrifice, they would go to the labor, they would wash their hands. They would wash their hands. And it makes sense. When you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the next step that you need to take is what? Baptism. And that's why Jesus says to Nicodemus in Matthew chapter 3, he says, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So baptism is a necessary thing that we need to do. So the sinner accepts Jesus Christ, then they are, then they are baptized as a public confession, or uh, yeah, confession to everybody that I have accepted Jesus Christ in my life. By the way, here's something beautiful. Remember I told you Jesus is, so the sinner is coming one direction, Jesus is coming the opposite, from the opposite direction, right? So when Jesus is, is, is traversing the opposite direction, what comes first, the labor or the altar of burnt sacrifice? The labor. Did Jesus get baptized before he died? Yes. You guys see something there? Jesus is meeting the sinner where they are at. We're moving one direction, and the sinner, or we are moving one direction, and Jesus is moving the, uh, the other direction to meet us. How beautiful. It gets deeper, friends. And I should be ending right now, huh? <laughs> it's hard. It's tough. It's tough. All right. We'll go through this pretty quickly, though. Uh, turn your Bibles with me to, uh, we don't have time. Let me just say this. <laughs> you don't have time. You don't have time. All right, let's just say this. When Adam and Eve, when they left the garden, right, a blessed place, perfect, peaceful, harmonious place. When they left the garden, when they were banished from the garden, they had lost three privileges. How many privileges? Three privileges. Can anyone guess what those privileges are? All right, we sound like Babylon. All right, let's try to try. Check this out, okay? Here, <laughs> no offense. Here are the three here are the three privileges that we had lost. The first one is access to the tree of life. The second privilege that we had lost is face-to-face communion with God. And the third thing that we had lost is the robe of righteousness. Okay, let me, let me explain those a little bit. Access to the tree of life. Do you know why man was not able to have access to the tree of life? Do you know why? Let me read you guys... Uh, this quote from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 60, paragraph 3. Powerful. In order to possess an endless existence, man must continue to partake of the tree of life. Right? So you got to eat continually from the tree of life. Some people say that's durian fruit, right? But <laughs> Deprive of this, his vitality, uh, yeah, his vitality would gradually diminish until life should become extinct. It was Satan's plan that Adam and Eve should by disobedience incur God's displeasure. And then, if they failed to obtain forgiveness, he hoped that they would eat of the tree of life and thus perpetuate an existence of sin and misery. Did you guys catch that? There is a reason why God could not allow Adam and Eve to partake of the tree of life because if they were to do that, they would perpetuate sin and misery. So God had to guard the way to the tree of life. Second thing, face-to-face communion. Remember I, taught, I, I referred to you, Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1 and 2. It is our iniquities that separate us from God, and it is our iniquities that cause God's face to hide from us. That's why Moses, when he said, God, can I see you? Can, can I see your glory? Did God just unveil his face before him? Thankfully, he didn't, right? Because if he did that, what would have happened? Boop, he's gone. Because sin and righteousness cannot coexist, Right? Moses was a sinner. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. When we committed sin, God had to veil his face from us. He had to veil his face. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. For the sake of time, I'll just move on. But there's a third thing I mentioned. There's a robe of righteousness that was taken away from them, right? That's why they had to try to clothe themselves, and Jesus had to replace them, uh, the, the, their fig leaves with, with animal skins. Do you guys remember... Um, the Bible says, and I think the end of Genesis chapter 2, it says that both Adam and Eve were naked. They were what? Now, was that before sin or after sin? Before, right? Because Genesis chapter 3 is when sin came into the, into the world. They were naked before, and they were naked after. But what did they lose? They lost the righteousness of God. 
Though they were naked before the fall, they were clothed with the light of Christ's righteousness. Amen? And so when they committed that sin, they had lost that. They had lost that. And there is a verse that, um, that I, I can use to prove that. It's in the book of Psalms. I don't have it here in my notes. Can't remember from the top of my head. Uh, but it basically talks about how God is, he, he wears a garment of lights. And when God created Adam and Eve, he created Adam and Eve after whose image? His image. So when he created them, they too had a garment of light. They were clothed with God's righteousness. So the three things, they lost access to the tree of life. They lost face-to-face communication with God. They lost the robe of righteousness. But here's the beautiful thing. When you look at the sanctuary, God slowly restores those things back to them, back to us. Beautiful. All right, let's move on. So you have the courtyard, then you walk into the holy place of the sanctuary. And when you get to the holy place, what's the first thing you see on the right-hand side? I hope I'm getting this right. Right Right-hand side. Table of showbread. If you look in front of you, you have the altar of incense. If you look to your left, you have the seven-branch candlestick. All right, uh, yeah, you don't have to. Let's go back to the table of showbread. All right, so there's this table and there's bread, right? There's bread. I had told you that the first thing that uh, Adam and Eve had lost, right? One of the, fir- well, the first privilege they had lost is what? Access to the tree of life. Because if they partake of the tree of life, then they have eternal life, right? They can continue to live for eternity. We have loaves of bread here. And just to keep it very simple, what, do, what does bread represent in the Bible? Jesus says in John chapter 6, verse 35, that I am the bread of life. And in John chapter 1, it also talks about how he is the word, right? So how is it that you and I can, in a sense, still experience eternal life? How can we still experience the quality of eternal life today? By partaking of the bread of life, which is the word of God. Amen? Amen? And by the way, that's why we need to be spending more time in God's word, right? We're, we're doing ourselves a disservice if we're putting this on the side, on the shelf, just to collect dust. And we're studying other books that are not anything better than this, right? The word of God gives us life. It does, life more abundant. And so we need to be spending more time in God's word. There's a first, the thing in front of us is the altar of incense. What, is the, what does incense represent? Prayer. Let's turn our Bibles real quick to Psalm chapter 141, verse 2. Psalm chapter 141 and verse 2. Going through this rather quickly and we'll come to a close here. Psalm chapter 141, looking at verse 2. Is the church there? Amen? Interesting. The prayer. Uh, uh, <laughs> just gave you the answer. Look at uh, verse 2. Verse 2, Psalms 141, verse 2. Let my what? Prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Though we have lost face-to-face communication with God, God still gives us the privilege to speak with Him, to commune with Him. And how? Through prayer. Amen. So we need to be studying our word. We need to pray without ceasing. And on the left, if you're in the holy place, there is a seven-branch candlestick. What, is, what, is, what does that represent? You guys know? The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 to 16, you have to turn there for the sake of time, but it says, ye are the light of the world, so that when others behold of that light, what is going to happen to them? They're going to glorify God. Amen? So what does light essentially represent? It essentially represents witnessing. Right? It essentially uh, represents witnessing. So though we have lost that robe, you know, when we had committed a sin, we can regain that robe through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? And we can slowly emit the glory of God in our own day-to-day lives by witnessing to others, telling others about the love of Jesus, telling others about the story of the sanctuary, telling others about what we learn in our devotions. Amen? By doing that, we can be the light of the world. So it's beautiful, friends. If you're in the courtyard, you accept Jesus Christ by accepting his sacrifice. You profess to everybody that I'm a follower of Christ. I want everybody to know through the the, the rite of baptism 
Then you walk into the holy place, and it is in the holy place. And by the way, I, just, I should say this. Courtyard is the justification experience. The holy place is the sanctification experience. And the most holy place is the glorification experience. So you are justified in the courtyard. In the holy place, God then brings you into experience of sanctification and is this continuous cycle of studying God's word, praying without ceasing, and doing the commission that he has called you to do. Amen? Are you guys seeing the process of coming back to the Lord? Now we're coming to our end. As you do that, as you're constantly studying the word, praying without ceasing, as you're witnessing, slowly God is working in your life. Slowly, God is helping you remove those deficiencies. He's helping you remove those sins in your life. He's helping you grow in character. Amen? Because character is the most important thing in this world. Amen? Nothing else. Your character is the most important thing. That's the only thing that you will take with you to heaven. Isn't that true? So we need to be investing more time in building our characters by by communion with God and doing his work. My friends, if we continue to walk with the Lord, as Enoch did, as Moses did, as many of our patriarchs and prophets of old had done, if we are able to walk with the Lord on a day-to-day basis through justification, through sanctification, turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Notice what the Bible says. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. We are told that Jesus is going to come back again. Isn't that true? He says, behold, I come quickly. And notice what it says in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. Let's look at verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called what? Children of God. What a privilege. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Isn't that powerful? When Jesus Christ comes back the second time to claim his own, they will be like him in character, and they will be able to see Jesus face to face. Wow. Communion with God, direct uh, face to face communion with God will be restored. And then we have glorification, right? Which we move into the most holy place, and that's where the altar of or uh, the Ark of the Covenant is, right? Not the altar of sacrifice. Okay, Ark of the Covenant. And what is in the Ark of the Covenant? The Ten Commandments? Yes, and those things as well. But look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16. You have to turn there. Uh, we are told that the new covenant is this. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. Says the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. I will write them. Let's turn to our... Uh, Final passage, Exodus chapter 25, verse 22. Exodus chapter 25, looking at verse 22. So once man is able to be in the very presence of God, to see him face to face, notice what it says in Exodus chapter 25, speaking about the Ark of the Covenant. Is the church there? It says... Let's look at verse 21. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. And there I will do what? I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are on the ark of the testimony about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. The ark of the covenant, that is where God's presence is. That's where God's throne is. Are you excited to stand before the throne of the Lord? Amen? I am so excited. I cannot wait. And by the way, there is a promise that we will inherit a city, right? And what is that city called? New Jerusalem, where there will be no more sun. Why? Because the presence of God is there. The Bible even says in Revelation chapter 21, verses 3, I think verses 3 and 4, it talks about how there will be no more death, no more crying, no more sorrow. None of those things. Why? Because everything will pass away. Sin will have been dealt with, and that's the purpose of the sanctuary, is it not? To deal with the sin problem so that way whatever, yeah, whatever that is that's separating us between God will be done away with, and we can be in the presence of God again. We can be in the presence of God again. And by the way, we will have access to the tree of life. 
How many of you want to eat of that tree? Amen? I'll, be, I'll probably be the first one to run over there and butt, take a bite. I'm excited. I hope you guys are excited as well. We'll see Enoch. We'll see Noah. We'll see, like, Paul. We'll just have a good time, guys. It's going to be a great party. Um, and uh, I hope I can see everyone there. But how many of you today, as you've heard the story of the sanctuary, want to say, Lord, walk me through the sanctuary today? Amen? If that's your will, please stand up, and let's bow our heads in commitment to the Lord.